And this Sunday we find that word in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 3. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not exhort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectant, expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There is something deeply outrageous about Advent. So outrageous that none of us really believes it. Nevertheless, we are the baptized people of God who have promised to share such a vision. So this morning I invite you to let Isaiah's words seep into your bones, your heart, your vision. God speaks. New heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem. It will be a world of rejoicing when this newness comes. Do you know why? Heaven and earth will rejoice because in this new world, created by God, there will be no more weeping, no more infant mortality, nor more children who live or who die too young, no more old people who live too feebly, or continue as a shell while life is gone. Heaven and earth will rejoice because in this new world created by God, there will be no more confiscation of people's homes. Those who build will inhabit. Those who plant will harvest. 
every person will live safely under a fig tree at peace, unafraid, without destruction, without competitive anxiety. Heaven and earth will rejoice because in this new world created by God, God will be attentive, knowing before we call what is needed. So we will live without dread or fear, without jeopardy or grief. And we shall never be left alone again. I told you it was outrageous because the new world of God is beyond our capacity. It's beyond our imagination, beyond our self-sufficiency, beyond our cynicism that such newness could never happen here. Not in any future we can conjure. In Advent, however, we receive the power, we receive the promise of the power of God that lies beyond us. We receive it willingly because it is the antidote to our fatigue. We grasp it eagerly because it is the gospel resolution to our self, to our spent self-sufficiency when we are at the end of our rope. We crave it because it is the good news that overcomes our skepticism, that imagines there is no new thing that can enter into our world. Advent is the pondering of this outrageousness that will outdo the weariness many will suffer even over Christmas. Into this world, says our gospel, pushes the unkept, unwelcomed figure of John the baptizer. You remember him. He's dressed in camel's shirts and eats locusts and wild honey and other such things he can forge from the wilderness. John comes really to speak only one word. Repent. Recognize the danger you're in and change. John comes as the best and the last of the old tradition, the tradition of law. He comes with a deep sense of urgency about the world. But it is not an urgency of newness. It's an urgency of threat and danger. One that we ourselves sense about our world. If only we could see the way things really are. John comes first in the story. John comes before Jesus. John comes as the key player in this season of Advent. When Jesus finally does arrive, John the baptizer promptly acknowledges the greatness of Jesus. Greater than John. Greater than all that is past. Greater than ancient memories and hopes. When Jesus arrives, John quickly acknowledges, he must increase, I must decrease. So here we have it. We have this outrageous vision, so overwhelming in its claims. There's nothing to do about this vision 
other than to wait for it and watch for it. But what to do while we wait and watch? Move now from this large vision to the small discipline of John. If John embodies all that is old, if, and Jesus embodies all that is new, take as your Advent discipline this enterprise of decreasing and increasing. Decrease what is old and customary and destructive in your life so the new life-giving power of Jesus may increase in you. Decrease what is greedy, what is consumerism, for the increase of simple, life-giving sharing. Decrease what is fearful and defensive for the increase of of life-giving compassion and generosity. Decrease what is false and deceptive for the increase of life-giving, truth-telling about you, about your neighbor, about your society, about your entanglement in this society. Decrease what is hateful and alienating for the increase of healing and forgiveness, which are finally the only source of life. Advent baths in great promises. In the meantime, there are daily disciplines day-to-day -day exercises, work that requires time and intentionality, that has nothing to do with the busyness the world imposes upon us. Advent is not for sitting around. It is for pondering and noticing, renouncing and receiving. We watch well, we notice the increase of gospel living, of growing in compassion, of generosity of hope, of truth-telling, of healing and forgiveness. And as we watch and notice, we go out. Go out from old, tired stuff. Go out from the fears that divide you. Go out from the quarrels unresolved. Go out from the sins unforgiven. Go out from old memories that have become graven images. Go out into God's new demanding mission. As you, as you go, singing, celebrating, grateful, Know that the mission of the church is not finished. The work of the church is not a holding action. The future of this church is not business as usual. But we'll get into more of that next week. For now, know this. As the gifts of the gospel embodied in Jesus increase in us. Something peculiar and cosmic happens in our midst. We begin to hear the rustle of a new heaven, a new earth. And now it does not sound so outrageous. In its coming, as we go about the daily work of decreasing, so we might increase in the outcome which goes like this. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. That'll be some newness, some Christmas, 
some gospel. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.